I trust you'll enjoy our time in our Old Testament overview as we study the 39 books of the Old Testament. I, I, I consider this a great blessing to be able to do this with you, and we've provided some resources at pastorshawn.com slash old, pastorshawn.com slash forward slash old. You'll find um, a basic breakdown, uh, an overview of every one of these 39 books there in that uh, that website. you also find videos and other resources that uh, I'll be putting there to help you understand the beauty and significance of the Old Testament and the incredible picture it paints of a God who is working his eternal plan of redemption and the promise of a Messiah. And so again, pastorshawn.com slash old for any one of the sessions, this session or any one of the sessions, you can find resources there. May God bless you as you walk with me through the Old Testament. Well, welcome to the 10th session of our Old Testament overview. I've enjoyed our journey together and I hope you haven't gotten too overloaded with some of the details uh, of our study. And uh, we're going to be looking today at the book of Ezekiel, and then we'll look at the book of Daniel, these two large major prophets in the Old Testament. We have uh, begun, of course, way back. We began this journey way back in Genesis, and we worked our way through the first five books, which are the Pentateuch, the law, uh, written by Moses. And then we moved into the historical era where we looked at Joshua as he brought the people into the promised land, the era of the judges, and we talked about how uh, God put David on the throne and David became this great king that united so much of the land and brought the people together and the 12 tribes together. Solomon, his son, then reigned and it was a great time of peace and prosperity. And then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, blew it. Uh, this would be around 900 uh, BC or so. And the nation of Israel divided into two nations. There were 10 tribes that made up that one nation under David and and uh, Solomon, but after Rehoboam's uh, just mismanagement as a leader and a lack of wisdom, the nation divided uh, 10 tribes in the north with the nation, that nation being called Israel, two tribes in the south with that tribe being called Judah. And then we talked about how the northern kingdom was much more wicked than the southern kingdom and went to idols much faster and, and immorality and, and evil. And so God judged them through the Assyrian Empire who came in 722 BC and judgment fell on those people. And then in 586 BC, God judged the southern kingdom of the two, two tribes in the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was the capital. Jerusalem, as we talked about, was under siege and Jeremiah, the prophet, had warned and warned and warned, and he laments the pain and suffering, the judgment that God has brought on his people uh, through some of their um, neighbors, who were really, many of them, very pagan and wicked nations, but God used them to judge his special people, his chosen people. And all through the Old Testament, we have this theme that God is sending Messiah, that the law does not bring us what we ultimately need, the priests and the tabernacle, the temple, all of those things they fall short of what we really need to be right with God. And there is a Redeemer coming who would be the final sacrifice. And he would be then the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not just in all the universe, but he would reign here on earth and eventually make all things new. Now, in the process of looking at these different sections, we looked at the Pentateuch, we looked at the historical books, then we looked at some of the poetical books like, um, like Psalms and Proverbs. And then we begun to get into the area of the prophets and most of these prophets historically are after the time when the kingdom is divided. And so some of the prophets speak to both kingdoms. Some of the prophets speak to the southern kingdom of Judah or the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, some warned way in advance of the judgment that was coming. Some, like Jeremiah, saw the very judgment they had predicted. And part of what had been predicted would be as the nation of Judah would fall second historically and Jerusalem would fall, that Jerusalem uh, and the people there would be taken in exile and that time when Jerusalem would be there in ruins and the people would be off in exile in a foreign land, the, that period would be about 70 years. And we talked about how God used Ezra and Zerubbabel uh, and Nehemiah to bring the folks back from exile, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, reinstitute worship of God, the Jehovah God, uh, who had uh, kept that remnant during the exile would uh, be restored. And uh, so we're going to look at a couple more of the prophetic books. We're going to look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a big book. It's one that uh, you don't hear a lot of sermons out of it because of it, some of its complexity. 
It has a lot of meat. You almost have to take big sections that are hard to communicate in a sermon necessarily to understand what's going on. But let's look at Ezekiel. It means strengthened by God. That's his name, and that's what it means. It, the name Ezekiel is used twice in the book of Ezekiel and is used nowhere else in the Bible. So Jesus doesn't reference Ezekiel, no other New Testament writer. The section is prophecy, as we mentioned. The author and date, the opening verse names Ezekiel as the one receiving the visions of God recorded in the first three chapters of the book. And then the book continues. Uh, you can read the details there about that. Ezekiel is the easiest to date of the different prophetical books uh, because it includes a unique orderly sequence of dates. Some of the other prophets speak almost mysteriously of eras, and you don't know if they're speaking of the past or the present, the future sometimes. You don't know what their experience is, if they're ex describing their experience then in that moment, or if they're describing what they're seeing in a vision, as far as the timeline is concerned. We understand the, the distinctions between those things, but the timeline can often be confused. But Ezekiel is a very orderly, the most orderly of these books, and there is a clear indication of the historical setting from which he writes and then prophesies. The style of writing is apocalyptic and prophetic. There's a lot of imagery, allegory, parable that's used to communicate here. Uh, it's not just prophetic in the sense of uh, you know very uh, uh, strong language to describe judgment. It's it's even got imagery about some of the things you would think would uh, an author might be more direct. But you have to remember too that in the ancient world. Uh, there were a lot of, of images used, uh, very strong oral traditions, so words and the power of words, the creativity of words would be used, and Ezekiel matches uh, that in its, in its style. The theme and key verses, the theme is, as uh, Archer, uh, who has a great Old Testament overview, states that the theme is the fall of Jerusalem and Babylon uh, and the Babylonian captivity are necessary measures for God, for the God of grace to employ if he is to correct his disobedient people and draw them back from the complete and permanent apostasy they face. The day is coming when Jehovah will restore a remnant, uh, a repentant remnant, and establish them in a glorious latter-day theocracy with a new temple. And so the concept here is those who've been living in exile and been faithful to God as they return repentant for themselves and their nation. God has a great plan for them, and Ezekiel describes that. Ezekiel 33, 11 is perhaps the key verse to this book, as I see it. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? And so he's saying, I don't take pleasure in punishing and bringing the punishment of death on human beings. I would rather see them turn and repent and not face judgment. And um, that becomes a major part of the book of Ezekiel. Now, with all of the prophets, I think the at a glance chart that we look at is very helpful because it looks at it from different angles. So if you look at Ezekiel at a glance, uh, this is from Nelson's complete book of Bible maps and charts, a great book, and it gives you permission to use these kind of resources. Uh, the, the, you can see the chapters there from chapter 1 through 48. Just looking at the division, Ezekiel sees the glory. Ezekiel is commissioned to the work, signs, messages, visions, and parables of judgment. Then you have a section there from 25 to 33, the beginning of 33, judgment on surrounding nations. Another thing about the prophets, that we, when we read their writings, whether it's one of the major prophets, they had a significant voice and a significant presence in terms of number of words in the scripture, uh, in terms of not just the difference between major prophets and minor prophets, prophets who have a more limited ministry and a smaller uh, voice in the pages of Scripture, that's not just the only difference. And it's not just the difference of who spoke to Israel and who spoke to Judah, but some of the prophets spoke to Israel and Judah and the nations around them. Some spoke to Judah and the nations, or Israel and nations. But there were a couple of prophets that spoke directly to the nations, and Ezekiel is one of those that speaks uh, to each of these, uh, specifically the uh, Jerusalem, excuse me, Jude Judah and the surrounding nations. Then you've got the return of Israel to the Lord, the restoration of Israel and the kingdom. And that's a beautiful imagery of even what's to come when Jesus returns and establishes his glorious kingdom and reigns forevermore. Uh, the topic of the first section from chapter 1 through chapter 24 is before the siege, speaking of the siege of Jerusalem, much like uh, much like uh, Jeremiah. And then from 25-1 to the end of 32, we've got during the siege, around 586 BC, the, the three-year siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians to wear it down and finally conquer it. And then after the siege 
is picked up in chapter 33, 1 through 48, 35. And that, again, is so clear in the sequence of the historical setting and how he lifts up their eyes from the historical setting and look forward. It's very laid out by Ezekiel. Location of his writing is Babylon. Um, it's the primary place he writes from as he records all of this and his prophecies. The time is from 592 to 570 BC. Um, it's, it's the period in which at the center of this is, is the Babylonian armies moving into Judah, God's judgment falling because of their waywardness in Jerusalem being ransacked and taken. So there's some problems in the book of Ezekiel, some question how a man can be a prophet of doom and good. Well, that, um, when people question that, the answer to me is pretty obvious. Even Jesus spoke a lot about the positive things of walking with God, but he also gave great warning about judgment that was coming. Jesus spoke, spoke more about hell than he did heaven because he wanted to make sure people knew of that warning. How should we interpret chapters 40 to 48? This is a rebuilt Jerusalem, a temple, sacrifices, land divided, Israel ruling. The following is taken from, uh, from Beal, who writes on this. And uh, this is this great imagery that uh, we get in 40 through 48, where the, the, the kingdom is restored to Israel. This is after the time of their captivity. This is the imagery that even has prophetic imagery of what is yet to come in our lifetimes uh, when Jesus returns. And um, some see the temple as figurative. It's about Christ and the church and how it helps us understand. The temple is literal. That He's describing Solomon's temple and a literal return, uh, even with literal sacrifices. Um, and um, then there's even question as the imagery of one through three, and is this is this of something other than God Himself? And it's the imagery of God. Um, the, I lean toward the the uh, figurative example of the temple, and it's the picture of God's relationship with His people more than it's just specifically the idea that you're going to have all of those elements restored. Uh, because once Jesus comes and the final sacrifice and the, and the final mediator, the one mediator between God and man. Uh, much of the functions of the temple would not be necessary, but figuratively, Jesus fulfills all those things for us. The main characters are Ezekiel, Judah, Jerusalem. Uh, main events is the judgment to come, and actually then the judgment, and then the restoration that's to come. Theological significance, God will judge sin, but will restore his people when they do sin. When we're repentant, God is willing to receive us back and forgive us. And one of the major themes of all the prophets is a call to repent. What does repent mean? To turn from whatever you've been doing and whatever you've been trusting in, however you've been living that is opposed to the way God has for us. We turn from that in our minds, our hearts, and our wills. And we turn even volitionally of our will away from those things. And we say, we agree with you, God, those things are wrong. And we turn to God. And that is a repentance. It doesn't always have to have emotion attached to it. But sometimes when people repent, knowing how far they've been from God and how their sin has broken their lives down further, there is even an emotional uh, falling before God on our faces, uh, knowing that, that he is God and we're not. Um, and that we, we turn to him in our uh, waywardness that we've been living in. We turn away from that. That's the book of Ezekiel. Now let's look at the book of Daniel, another major uh, prophet, another major voice. Daniel is one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. The title of the meaning of the book is named after the author and principal character, Daniel. Uh, the section of the Bible is prophetic. It's an exilic prophecy. That means he is a prophet during that 70-year time of, time of exile, from the time that the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586 till 70 years later, when Jerusalem is rebuilt, the walls are rebuilt, the temple, the return to God under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and some of the exiles return from Babylon, where they've been taken. And uh, the author and date, I'll let you read that information there. There's a lot of good information, but it boils down to the fact that Daniel wrote this. And um, there's the reasoning and the, the arguments as to why even some of the Dead Sea Scrolls give us help in that. The style of writing is narrative and prophecy. We have some stories. We have the story of Daniel and his three friends, who were later named by the Babylonians Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that these four young men are taken in captivity from Jerusalem and Judah, and they are taken to Babylon, into the Babylonian Empire, and they are known and tested. They're probably physically healthy. They're very smart mentally and academically, and the Babylonians noticed that, and they would take the best and the brightest of the nations they conquered, and they would bring them into the upper echelon of advisors to the emperor because they would be wise men with perspectives of all over the world, very intelligent people who know histories that the Babylonians didn't know. And so it, the, these collection of these young men from around the empire by the Babylonians was a way to create a, 
it's kind of creating the living internet or the living encyclopedia, the living uh, deposit of information and knowledge and it's a resource. And so there probably were dozens of these kinds of uh, young men included. And Daniel and his friends are those. They're the ones that won't eat the, the diet that they don't believe they should be eating. And, and uh, they turn out to be healthier than those who eat the emperor's food. And so they stand up in that moment. Uh, the three friends don't bow to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. You've got the story of Daniel when the Persians have taken over the Babylonian Empire and they keep Daniel as an advisor. you got the story of Daniel uh, praying three times a day, but some who were opposed to him uh, tricked the emperor into making a law that you can't do that. And Daniel continues to do that in obedience to God. And uh, he's arrested and thrown into the a lion's den as his friend the emperor is tricked into being forced to pour out the judgment he had said would fall on anyone who prayed and Daniel kept praying and kept talking to the Lord and he was thrown in the lion's den. And then of course the Lord shut the lion's mouths. There's also the story of Nebuchadnezzar and his arrogance in Daniel 4. He declares himself God and look at Babylon what I have done and he brags about I, 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 look at me. And God makes him like a beast and he wanders for uh, the course, uh, a course of time. And God finally restores him when Nebuchadnezzar comes to his senses, the chapter says in Daniel 4, and he looks up and he declares God, the God of Jehovah, the God. And at that moment, he is restored to being a man rather than a beast wandering. And um, so there's some narrative aspects to the stories that are told. And a lot of times we skip the prophecies and the predictions of Daniel, just to get to those stories, often in Sunday school and even, even with adults. The theme in key verses, the theme is that God is in control of world history. Daniel uh, lives the vast majority of, life, of his life in exile, not in his homeland. He lives really as a captive and being used for his resources, his talents, his abilities by the Babylonians and then the Persians when they conquer the Babylonians. And uh, But what Daniel communicates is God is in control of his own circumstances. God was in control when he allowed the Babylonians to judge Jerusalem and Judah. And then his predictions, he's saying, look, God knows the end. I was just talking to someone as I walked into the church building this morning, and, and uh, they were saying they've been reading the book of Daniel. And I said, oh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about that book. And, and they said, uh, they said, well, you know, what, what I don't understand is why do people panic when we see these things coming true in, the, in our times? And why are they panicked to try to fight all this? And I said, I don't know. You know, we're, we're not supposed to be trying to find the Antichrist and point him out. We're, we're supposed to be trying to point out Jesus and uh, the Antichrist will come and, and the things that God has predicted will come. And we need to be clear in our witness for Jesus now so that no one will be left behind and all will know Christ. But when we get so upset about the prophecies to the fact that we're going to try to stop these things, God says they're going to happen because God is in control of world history. And Daniel lays it out so beautifully. Look at the book at a glance. This is so important. Uh, the, you can see there the divisions. The personal life of Daniel is he's taken captive. He doesn't eat the diet. Then you have the visions of Nebuchadnezzar, the vision of Belshazzar, the decree of Darius. Uh, that's then uh, the, the four beasts that follow in the imagery that Daniel has. You've got this, this huge tower, the, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar with uh, feet of clay, and it's made of different metals. And Daniel interprets a dream and says there's an empire that's coming that will do this, and that becomes the Persians. They fulfill that prophecy. Then the Greeks, then the Romans. And then there is a time when it's all divided, and it speaks of our time and eventually uh, what the world will look like in terms of nations and governments in the end times. And, and Daniel interprets that great statue and the vision of the eras to come. Um, then you see in chapter 8, verse 1, the vision of the ram and the male goat, the vision of the 70 weeks. And one thing we, we often forget, and I want to make this mention here as we see the vision of 70 weeks. The vision of 70 weeks is that there are seven times seven coming. There are seven weeks uh, that are coming out, and these weeks are seven days. And we, we look at that and we say, so what? Why 70 weeks? Why is that a, a, a space of measurement, if you will, in time? Well, it's because in the Old Testament, they didn't think in tens. We think, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents, you get 10, 10 cents, and you have a dollar, right? And then you get $10, and you build that up, and you get $100. Then you build up enough hundreds, you get to thousands, thousands to millions, but it's all based on tens. The People of Israel uh, thought in terms of sevens based on the seven days of creation. 
And so then God put into their system that every seven years there would be a year of rest for the land and it would be a year of peace. And then every uh, seven years uh, of seven, on the 49th into the 50th year, the 50th year would be called a year of Jubilee where there was a restoration economically and everything. Well, Daniel sees things in terms of that same kind of measurement they had in the Old Testament. In the uh, topical section of the chart of glance, you have Daniel's background, Daniel interprets other people's dreams, and then the angel interprets Daniel's dreams. There's a great, in chapter 10, there's this great uh, uh, encounter David has with an angel. He prays and he's looking to God and he's pouring his heart out to God for hope and insight. And uh, uh, an angel comes and he indicates that a demon over the region of Babylon had stopped him from getting there sooner. And we get this the, the, the uh, curtains between us and heaven are pulled back. And this angel explains to Daniel that there's a war going on all the time as we're crying out to God in prayer. And there's a battle taking place that we don't see, a spiritual battle. Uh, and that's such a great glimpse of what's going on uh, when we are going about our daily lives and crying out to the Lord. There's a spiritual battle all around us. Of course, this is written from Babylon and then really Persia. Um, the time is, of this writing is from 605 to 536 uh, B.C. in totality and the, the story it tells. The other thing I want to say about Daniel is it is perhaps the book that when the wise men come, they come from this region. And so it's possible that there are some things in Daniel and then that Daniel or others uh, that were living in exile had other prophecies that were not included in scripture, but were indications for these wise men to be looking for this star, for the one who'd be born king of the Jews. Then you've got problems, the dreams and visions of the book. And I, I think you can check out that chart there, the correlation of dreams and visions of Daniel. And I've already talked about the Daniel 70 weeks. The main characters are there with Daniel and then his name and then the three friends and their names. Um, and then you've got Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians. He's the, the story of the handwriting on the wall. If you'll remember, that that's another narrative story. Darius, king of the Persians, who throws Daniel in the lion's den. The main events and concepts, you can see Daniel at a glance. Um, so what's the theological significance of this book of prophecy? God is in control of human history. God is in control. He was in control of Daniel's life. He was in control of the judgment that was being poured out. He had measured out the 70 years. They'd be in exile before a rem repentant remnant would return. Um, God is in control of history now. He would be in control of history when the Messiah would come and the prophecies say God knows how this is all going to come to an end. God is in control. So what's the personal significance? We do not have to worry about or be anxious over world events. Um, I'm recording this actually on November 3rd. This is election day and um, you'll see this perhaps, uh, you'll definitely see this after uh, some of those results have come in. But one thing I know is that whatever happens in this election, our God is in control. He is in control of world events and he is working them uh, and he's raising up kings. This Daniel is uh, the, the book that gives us the phrase that God raises up kings and he takes down kings. Our God is the one who is in control of world history. And uh, that's the book of Daniel and that's the book of Ezekiel. These are the last two of the major prophets, including Isaiah and Jeremiah, that we're going to look at. Of course, those are the last two that are found in the Old Testament. I'm looking forward to our next time together. We're going to tackle all the minor prophets of the Old Testament.